see this afternoon. Uh, not that we're going to be here a whole afternoon, but uh, got to speak right into it. All right, is that better? Um, I want to thank everyone for coming and also thank, uh, I know, Kara and a good number of other people, probably Kara and Sarah and all sorts of people with the Environmental Coalition to help put this together. And uh, what we have for you today is, um, I think, four, maybe five speakers representing uh, different viewpoints. Uh, and uh, they'll be very short speeches. And then we are going to go out to the woods and have a ceremony. And uh, we thank all of you for being here. And I, I thought I would uh, mention the fact that I, I said that I was somewhat reluctant. I'm also somewhat ill-prepared because uh, just yesterday I thought how wonderful it was that I wasn't asked to be a speaker today. And uh, so I spent the day gardening and hiking and weeding and doing all the things that you like to do when you want to turn your brain off and just uh, be in a different zone. And so that's where I was yesterday. And last night I opened up my email and they wanted me to be an MC. So... Here I am. But uh, at the same time, I was feeling somewhat guilty because I realized all my good friends and colleagues were preparing their talks, and here I was getting the day off. But then I realized how important it would be for me just to be here as a witness, and I'm saying that because it's important that you all are here as witnesses to this event and to the ceremony. And so uh, I know firsthand from just yesterday how important I felt that would be. So thanks again. Um, the other thing that I thought of when I looked at the list of speakers... I thought, well, what kind of theme can I draw, uh, can I use to draw everybody in together? And I think most of you will understand uh, the idea that nature is a great role model for us. Um, when we're not sure what decision to make or how we should live, if you look towards nature, you can get, a, uh, you can get great instructions. And one of the great lessons that we learn from nature, especially ecologists uh, uh, such as myself, is the role that diversity plays. Diversity... Um, makes a community, it makes any organization stronger and more resilient. And when you have diversity, usually the decisions that are made by a diverse group are much wiser decisions than when you lack that diversity. And so your speakers today will include a mother and a daughter and a grandmother and a grandfather and a father. And uh, you'll get all those viewpoints, and I think that you'll see that they tie together nicely. And uh, with that, I will introduce uh, one of our fathers, and his name is Dr. John Seiler. John, um, you want to start making your way up? Let me, let me say a few words about John. John is my colleague in the Department of Forestry at Virginia Tech. And when I came to the campus um, in 1998, uh, I remember what a daunting place this was, and uh, into work. Is that all right? <laughs> and so uh, uh, John was the first person to, to really treat me as, as a colleague and he welcomed me and he got me involved in things and I've always uh, appreciated uh, what he did for me to help me get established here at Virginia Tech and, um, and, and what great knowledge and what great enthusiasm he brings to this. So John, I'm going to give you the bullhorn now. Have you ever used a bullhorn before? No, but I'm going to see. Hold, hold just a second. If I just talk like this, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear. Good? Because I, I speak in large classrooms, and I would rather, but if you can't hear, is that all right? You got to, you got to, in the back, just kind of give me a, something like that, okay? If, if it's not, if it's going down. So I, I just would rather do that. Actually, Jeff, uh, that was a pretty good speech, actually, so, uh, for, for not being prepared. I, uh, I've never done anything like this called a rally, and uh, Kara said, speak for about three minutes, and professors, when they start talking, it's 50 <laughs> minutes, okay? And if it's a Tuesday or Thursday, it's an hour and 15. So I guess we're going to see what we get. I, I came, I say I never did a rally, but I came from, just came from a rally. Uh, it's a little different than this kind of rally. It's called church. Uh, may, maybe some of you were attending church this morning, but uh, it's, I guess that's a different goal, but, but probably not. Uh, I mean, it really actually helps me keep things in perspective, you know, amongst all this angst and uh, turmoil. And actually, at times, I guess it's fair to say we get, we're get we getting pretty angry. Uh, 
And I, I was going to speak a little on the history of the opposition, but not, not, not get anything very specific. We, we have come a really long way in our opposition to building this athletic practice facility in Stadium Woods, and, and this is a testimony uh, to that. But it, uh, with me, it began with a very small mention, this, this may be news to some of you, at, a, at closing Arboretum Committee. At the very end of it, I'm on the Arboretum Committee, which gives advice about campus tree care. And of course, Stadium Woods is a, a large body of trees. And it was simply mentioned that an athletic practice facility is going to be built. And they showed various locations and said, there's, there's alternate locations, but Coach Beamer wants it here. Here was a finger point to Stadium Woods. And, and I told the person at the time out in the hallway that if you ever wanted something that would have people chaining themselves to trees, this was going to be it. Right. And I at the time believed this is never, this isn't going to happen. You know, when they find out, you know, what, what's in these woods, it, it, it's not going to happen. And I also want to say from the very beginning, I think everybody here is in the same opinion of this. We've never been opposed to the facility. Again, as sound bites have been delivered out in the community, uh, that's been twisted a little bit. We, we are not opposed to it. I, I'm a hokey, and uh, this is one of their sugar bowl jackets. It's one of my prized possessions. Someone inside the athletic department gave it to me, and I don't even think he was supposed to give it to me. Okay, but no one's actually asked me back for it, so I, I think it's okay. We're not against this, but it really is time for the leaders of this nation, the Hokey Nation, it's a, it's, it's a nation, to make the right decision. It, I mean, time, time is enough. And, well, I, I, never, I never had that happen at any time. <laughs> between, between computers and they're on Facebook and they're just over here, they're not even paying attention in class. <laughs> anyway, I, I mentioned I, I, I teach here and I teach in the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation. And we used to be just known as forestry. And it's never been more important to me that in our name now it includes environmental conservation. Because uh, that, is, that is what it's all about at this point in, in time. When I was teaching class just a few weeks ago, I'll just let that go by just for a minute. Literally, it was just two, two weeks ago. Uh, I was profiling John Muir uh, in, in this class, uh, the naturalist, and he, he's been called patron saint of, the, of Amer American environmental activity, a patron saint of that. And I came upon this quote, and, and honestly, I, I had my mind off Stadium Woods for the moment, you know, I guess teaching, but it struck me nearly silent, which I'm told is hard to do. Uh, <laughs> but here's the quote, and I see it on a sign right here. God, God has cared for these trees, Save them from drought, disease, avalanches, and thousand tempests and floods. But he cannot save them from fools. And so here we are, uh, nearly a hundred years after Muir's death, and we find ourselves in, in this struggle. And what I mean by that is one of Muir's biographers understood John Muir. He said John Muir's mission, as he understood it, was saving the American soul from total surrender to materialism. Saving our soul from total surrender. And here we are at, at this, this time. So for 300 years, long before Muir was even born, well, God has cared, I'll paraphrase that, that quote again. God has cared for these trees in stadium woods, saved them from drought, disease, an expanding town, an expanding university, a civil war, but he can't save them from fools. Now originally the decision to place that facility in Stadium Woods was made out of ignorance. And I'll say convenience. And some of the strongest opposition right now coming out of Virginia Tech facilities is purely convenience. They don't want to work hard at making and doing proper urban planning. It's purely convenience. If we have to move the tennis courts, we have to deal with that. If we have to move the hockey rink, we have to deal with that. They just don't want to deal with it. No, the, the trees don't speak out, except they do. And they're, and they're, and they're finding that out. We, 
we know, and they know, I should say, I'm, 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 they, they know these woods are very, very rare and unique, as national experts have testified. They have heard all that. They know it's the single largest collection of old white oaks anywhere in the eastern U.S. Or I could say, it's, it's likely. And certainly it is in an urban setting between a town and a university. I dare say there's not another one. We know dozens and dozens, maybe even 100 birds use those woods. They know that. They know it's used for classes as part of one of the top national research pro resource programs in the U.S. that I'm, that I'm part of. Our classes are glad to hear that. They, they know all this. The ignorance is gone. The CT knows this. The Roanoke Times knows this. The Washington Post now knows this. You know, the opposition is growing. CNN is soon going to know this. They're coming. Over 6,000 people on the petition all know this. And the Hokie Nation knows this. The ignorance is gone. Placing that facility in Stadium Woods would be foolish. I looked up the definition of a fool. It's deficient in judgment, sense, and understanding. And for us to be complicit in that, and, and even to just to turn our heads to that, would make us fools. And it's time to raise our voices, and tell the administration, tell facilities, and tell athletics, enough is enough, call it off, and work hard at getting this thing placed for the Hokie Nation in one of the other, I'm going to say, numerous locations, although they will not ever say it. They need, they need to work hard at it. It's hard. And Virginia Tech is known for Invent the Future. Now let's go do it. speaker is um, Betty Fine. Be I asked Betty how she would like for me to uh, introduce her. I'm looking for Betty in the train. Oh, there she is. Okay, great. Great where you should be. <laughs> and uh, she said, just simply say that uh, I teach in the Appalachian Studies program, and I believe that she's in charge of the Appalachian Studies program. No? No? Okay. All right. Well, I'm sure she does a lot, and uh, uh, I think most people, when they come to Virginia Tech, uh, are, if not drawn, uh, from the very beginning, they become drawn to the Appalachian Mountains where we live, and so um, and the, our woods are so much a part of that. And um, uh, she's also a mother and a grandmother, and we welcome your uh, your perspective, Betty. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Stadium Woods is a miracle. Those are the words of Emeritus Professor Jeff Kerwin, who just introduced me, an expert on the old growth trees of Virginia. Many of these rare old white oaks are 250 years old or older. They were standing here before the first European settlers came to the Blacksburg area in the 1740s. Think of the history. We can sit under the very same trees that were alive when James Patton and Mary Draper Ingalls established the Draper's Meadows Settlement between Solitude by our Duck Pond and Smithfield. Then think of the science. Virginia Tech students have a living laboratory within walking distance to study a biologically diverse and rare forest system and the remarkable life forms that it shelters. What a miracle this place is. But this forest also plays a role in a global crisis now unfolding. We are living in an era of rapid climate change and the greatest mass extinction of species since the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. An overwhelming majority of scientists tell us that human actions, such as burning fossil fuels and deforesting our planet, 
are creating so much carbon dioxide that the planet is overheating. Our oceans are rapidly acidifying and many creatures cannot adapt to these rapid changes. If we continue our destruction of the environment, one half of all species on the planet will be extinct in less than 100 years. So given the terrible environmental state of our planet, why is Virginia Tech even thinking of allowing the athletic department to violate the university's master plan and cut down even a part of this rare old growth forest? Why this old growth forest that helps cool Blacksburg and offset the massive amounts of carbon dioxide and other pollutants that are spewing forth daily from our coal-fired energy plant. The university should set a positive example of being on the forefront of environmental education and environmental Ecological farmer and activist Wendell Berry writes in Conserving Communities, always include local nature, the land, the water, the air, the native creatures within the membership of the community. Always ask of any proposed change or innovation, what will this do to our community? How will this affect our common wealth? The athletic department has made it abundantly clear that it does not value local nature, that it does not value the environment, that it does not value our local community. To knowingly kill even a part of this miracle forest is to act out yet again the tragedy of the commons slowly but surely nibbling away at the fabric of life on this planet. The EPA estimates that 2,200 square miles of forest will be lost this year by 2012 in Appalachia from mountaintop removal mining that is turning our mountains into moonscapes. With this forest loss, we will lose the capacity to sequester 3.14 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. This voracious and rapid cannibalization of our mountains and forests by mountaintop removal has already made Appalachia the epicenter of environmental destruction in the United States. Will Virginia Tech, a land-grant university, let a miracle forest fall to a short-sighted and environmentally ignorant athletic department The prizes expediency and convenience above all else? No! no. 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 <laughs> Do we want to be known as the university that killed a forest treasure? No! no. no. I urge you all to do everything in your power to save the Miracle Forest. White oak trees can live 600 years. Many of these trees are in their prime. We call this an old growth forest only because very few human beings make it to be 100 years old. Stadium Woods can continue to grace Virginia Tech's campus for another 300 years and beyond as this forest continually reseeds and replenishes itself. So let's tell Virginia Tech, let them live. Let, let them, them live. live. Save our miracle forest. Save, Save our miracle forest. forest. Save Stadium Woods. Save Stadium Woods.
requires money. We have to pay for posters, we have to pay for paper, printing, and all sorts of things. And Kara and her student environmental coalition so far has been willing to take donations and, uh, and let us use that money that is raised in donations to, um, to do the kind of little things that we need to do. And it, it does add up. Um, I think the poster alone that you see over here costs $400. Uh, to be designed and be printed. And so, uh, so far, most of the money has come from um, the people that are organizing this event, but it sure would be nice to have some help from other people. And uh, so, Kara, you are going to raise your hand, right? Kara, raise your hand. Okay. This is Kara, Kara Dodson, uh, a student here at Virginia Tech. She's a member of the Student Environmental Coalition. And if you'd like to help support us, uh, you can give her cash, you can give her checks, um, probably not a credit card, but anyway, she'll, she'll take whatever help she can get. Okay, our next speaker, um, we really appreciate her coming and, and sharing time with us. Betty Hahn is, um, uh, brings a lot of perspectives to Virginia Tech. I think, as, you, as you'll see, she grew up here and she's connected in ways that um, uh, many of us will admire and respect. Her name is almost synonymous with Virginia Tech. I know when I came in 1978, uh, it was just after her um, father stopped being the president of Virginia Tech, and ever since then, people seem to be talking about him. And uh, and I know he visits a neighbor of ours, an, an elderly woman. Um, he still visits her on a regular basis just because her husband served him um, when he was president, and um, I think everybody admires uh, the family and uh, all they've done for Virginia Tech, and so we're really, really delighted to have Betty uh, share her perspective. And so, Betty, come on up. way? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have had a lifelong connection with this university, and I feel quite strongly about this issue. I'm a Virginia Tech graduate myself. I'm a faculty member in the Appalachian Studies program also, a local resident, a Hokie parent, a Virginia Tech supporter, and in fact, I literally grew up on this campus. I do recognize the need for this practice facility, the necessity for its proximity to the stadium. I also, though, understand the incredible value of such a rare old-growth forest. From the outcry about these woods, it seems that a lot of other people recognize this as well. Any university with a powerhouse athletic team can have a dream building. How many can also have this unique old-growth ecosystem? Practically no none, right? Um, the university has, been, has built buildings and parking lots, has moved tennis courts to build a basketball practice facility. Surely this university, whose motto is invent the future, can come up with a plan for a building that does not destroy an irreplaceable ecosystem. In fact, they already have come up with such a plan. The long-range plan has consistently shown the area of Stadium Woods as a permanent greenway and shown the proposed building close by but not in the woods. It is not true, as many are saying, that this will only impact a small number of these trees. I heard it said three trees. This is laughable. Or that the trees can be replaced with new plantings. The proposed building involves removing some 30 feet of elevation. Just the removal of the dirt alone will cost $2 million. I've walked in these woods. I've seen the stakes marking the roughly three-acre footprint of the building and its surrounding setback area. It's not possible to carve such a huge building out of the hill without immediately harming probably half of these trees and leaving the rest to degrade slowly and die. These are not just trees, as I've heard it said. Some of these trees were already big before the American Revolution. Somehow they survived not only the Civil War, when they showed up in an 1864 Confederate map, but also miraculously, they survived the savage and almost total clear-cutting of trees that went on in Appalachia in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It is a miracle that they have survived. Virginia Tech has three times been named Tree Campus USA by the Arbor Day Foundation. Virginia Tech's website 
features a campus sustainability portal with justifiably proud announcements of such achievements as energy conservation in new buildings and the installation of a major solar panel system on campus. What happens to our sustainable tree campus USA when we cut down a rare old growth forest? Many groups have weighed in in support of these trees, including the Virginia Tech Faculty Senate, the Virginia Tech Arboretum Committee, the Virginia Tech Army ROTC, the Student Government Association, and many others. I've heard it said that this is a case of tree huggers versus football. This is not true. It's an effort to disparage the real need for conservation here. There are many football fans among those who wish to save these trees. I've spoken to many myself. For that matter, the last time I checked, it was not yet a crime to be an environmentalist. <laughs> Come on, Virginia Tech, do the right thing. Let's pull together and support both Virginia Tech football and our beautiful God-given creation. Let's truly invent the future without destroying the living, breathing past. <laughs>
spending a week in, a, in the dorms on campus for a summer convention before you're a student, learning what the pylons mean and the meaning of UpProsum, and finally to becoming a Virginia Tech student and running and walking through the woods. These are the reasons why I am a Hokie. Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech has been a big part of who I am and how I grew up. And when I'm a mom, I want to share with my children the reasons why we are Hokies, and especially the stadium woods, and so that my children can be wowed at their historical significance and their minds can be broadened by their cultural, by their cultural impact. There is knowledge, heritage, culture, and inspiration in the stadium woods that can be shared with students all across the state of Virginia. And it has this indescribable capacity to be passed down from father to daughter to brother. To have an old growth forest on campus is worth something great. Just as to win a national championships in football is worth something great. The legacy of being a Hokie means a little something different to every Hokie. And it is the duty of the university to protect all of those legacies, especially the stadium woods. The stadium woods is why I am a Hokie. My, my double major at Virginia Tech, um, one of them is public relations. Um, that, is taught, that major has taught me that destroying the stadium woods would be a grand tragedy. And President Seeger, it would have countless environmental, emotional, and physical consequences that should be avoided at all costs. To lose, to lose the stadium woods would be to lose a place where students like me learn, live, and grow into leaders of tomorrow. All right. announcements before we're done here and we move on to our ceremony. I want to introduce Sarah. Sarah is back over here and uh, one of the lifebloods that we have of uh, our organization is, is a, a listserv and we send out notices to let people know what's going on and what we need help with. And if any of you would like to become more involved, um, just knowing when events are, being a witness to events, which is so important today, uh, please see Sarah. Uh, as we walk out to the stadium woods or um, uh, while we're still here and give her your name and your email address and all of that information so we can we can get you involved and um, that will be very critical. Uh, also uh, there is a, another student uh, Matt, uh, I think she's doing her fifth year and let me see I've forgotten uh, some type of architecture. Uh, Caitlin, where's Caitlin? Um, well I don't see her. But anyway Caitlin has has done one art design project in Stadium Woods to illustrate tree roots. If any of you remember when all those ribbons were placed out um, hundreds of feet from different trees to demonstrate where the root systems of these trees go and why we need uh, to avoid disturbing those roots in order to keep Stadium Woods as a functioning ecosystem. It was her work. And she's done another art project where she started it. And so she wanted me to mention that this week you can come by and look at her art project, and this is part of her uh, work as a uh, fifth year architecture student, but probably landscape architecture, and um, and so your participation in that artwork is important to her, and uh, and I think you will enjoy it. It's a fun way um, to learn uh, about ecosystems and, and how they work. So with that, um, I need to introduce to you, uh, uh, good for us, he's wearing blaze orange, and this is Doug Chansey. Uh, Doug is actually not speaking but he is going to lead us to the woods. And uh, I asked Doug how I could uh, introduce him, and he said, well, uh, a resident of the area. And I said, well, how about a farmer? He says, yeah, you can say that. So, <laughs> and, uh, and I know he's a husband. So uh, anyway, um, he is quietly going give to give us his perspective. And what we're going to do is um, uh, another one of our students at Virginia Tech, uh, Grazia, and I won't even I try to, I've never learned how to pronounce your last name, Grazia, but anyway, She's going to lead us in a ceremony out in Stadium Woods, uh, which I think we'll all enjoy, and um, 
uh, and it would be important to have uh, many witnesses to that as well. Is there something else I forgot? I saw some, a signal. Okay. Uh, where's Kara? Have I done everything, Kara? Okay. All right. I'll give the, uh, the megaphone to Doug. Thanks, folks. Uh, I'm not going to speak, but I do want to say I called one of my alumni friends that lives out of town this week and told him about Stadium Woods that he wasn't aware of, and he said, are you kidding? We used to make out those woods. No way. <laughs> so uh, anyway, now we have you all here. I know it's raining, but uh, we're going to ask you to go two by two on the sidewalks to walk behind me, and there'll be a couple of students bringing up the rear, but if you could all just get a little exercise and join us, stay two by two, and as we cross the streets, just do it very orderly. If the traffic gets backed up too much crossing the streets, maybe stop and let some of the traffic go by so we don't cause any 